The Lord be with you. My name is Pastor Jennifer, and it's my joy to welcome each and every one of you here to worship this morning. We're so grateful to have you with us. If you would like to connect with us, there are cards in your pew backs you're welcome to fill out and then drop in one of the offering boxes. We don't take up the offering by passing of the plate, but there's a box up front and there's a box in our welcome area, and so that will make its way to me, and I'd love uh, to connect with you in that way. Our youth this afternoon are going to have a pizza lunch here and head to Hub Bowling Lanes. And so they're going to have a good time for that. And so um, Sheen is helping head that up. And so uh, see her if you have any questions. On Friday, October 13th, Sarah Beth Gohagen is back for our backdoor coffee house. Fun fact, Sarah Beth was my uh, youth camp musician growing up. <laughs> so it'll be fun for me to see her as well. Um, as always, it's free, uh, child care and coffee and light desserts provided. Also, coming up fast is it's October, and so our trunk or treat is going to be on Wednesday, October 18th from 6 to 7 p.m. So if you can, we would love to have folks uh, decorate, volunteer to decorate a trunk, um, and we'll have uh, plenty of games. Artie from Hattiesburg is coming, and so it's going to be a great time with face painting, um, so we're going to invite all of Tim's Elementary School in Woodley. Um, so we should have just bukus of fun that night. Um, and then finally, um, I just wanted to uh, mention that our next uh, Prime Timers is coming up on October 24th. So you can find more information in your bulletin about that. So you may have noticed something slightly different this morning up here in this area. And that would be, uh, we are welcoming for our, their first performance, our children's choir under the direction of Ian um, to guide us this morning as we begin worship.
Please join me, if you can, in the call to worship. <laughs> Around the world, people gather to break bread and pour wine. We gather with them in heart and mind. Around the world, the broken body is made whole. As part of that body, we join in its unity. Around the world, the banquet of God is prepared for the table. We share the banquet eagerly to be fed. Let us worship together. Let us share God's bounty. Alleluia. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 463 from every race, from every clod. From every race, from every climb, your people gathered round. The emblems of your grace sublime with gratitude abound. Partaking of the bread, we know our strength from you derives. And Take the cup we go to witness with our lives. Throughout the world your table is set, dear Lord, our Savior, God. In hope we know that we shall yet in fellowship abide. From north to south, from east to west, we gather to recall. In reverent memory, your blessed redemptive love for all. Let us pray. Around the world today, groups of Christians are acknowledging your presence in worship as we do today. And they're sharing the holy meal of bread and wine that binds us together. Binds us together as followers of Jesus, learning to live lives of mercy and compassion as our many brothers and sisters in other faith traditions. Learning day by day to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, and to follow thee more nearly day by day. Especially in these trying times, we pray for courage, courage to stand with Jesus alongside the poor in spirit, alongside those who mourn, alongside the meek and those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, alongside the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. O oh God, especially the peacemakers, make us instruments of your peace, especially in this very unpeaceful world. We make this prayer this morning together in awe and wonder at the miraculous world we have been given, humbled at your creation, and in the name of Jesus, who is our friend, teacher, Savior, our Lord, our way to life, and our surrounding comforting presence. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today is from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9. In your pew Bible, that's on page 495. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. That's Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed 
who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O God. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I'll invite our children forward for our story for all ages. So I was thinking a lot recently about parties. And one of my favorite parties was a, a party that my friends planned for me for my 25th birthday. They had figured out how to pool all of our food points when we were in grad school. And you could go over to the Washington Duke Inn, which was like the nicest hotel in all of Durham. And you could use your food points to order steak and lobster and anything else that you wanted from their menu. And so we got to do that, and then they had planned a surprise up on a rooftop. So we were overlooking the Durham Bulls baseball stadium. Some of your parents know about that. 
and it was just a lot of fun. So can you think of a time when you were invited to a party, a special party? You ever been invited to one? Everyone goes to your party? Oh, yeah. Some, sometimes, yeah, you invite folks and they don't come. But have you ever been invited to a special party? Have you ever had a pizza party at school? Or pizza parties or birthday parties, right? Well, today, today is World Communion Sunday. So you can look up here on our altar. We have a globe representing the world. And so people all over the world are celebrating a special kind of feast. And so we get the feast from Jesus. He broke bread and he blessed it. We'll do that in a little bit. And then he poured wine and he blessed it. And he said that we can do this to remember him. And so I think that's helpful because sometimes we have friends we have to say goodbye to or, or people that are no longer in our life, but there are ways that we can remember them. And so this morning I have a picture for World Communion Sunday for us to look at. And so we've got the whole world represented here on our picture. You want to see? Can you see it? Yep. So as you go back to your seats, I'm going to give you a blank one for you to color in honor of our World Communion Sunday. Okay, will you pray with me real quick? We're going to say a different prayer than what we normally do. Dear God, thank you for your invitation to gather together to break bread and drink from the cup. May we remember your body broken for us and your love that was poured out for us. Amen. All right, take a sheet with you back to your seat. Thank you. I invite you now to join me in our litany of confession in your bulletin this morning. God made flesh, bone of our bone. We confess that we think we can go it alone, that we try to do it all. Then in doing so, we neglect the gifts you have given us. The bone of our bone, the flesh of our flesh, the bodies you created, and the relationships you created us for. Jesus Christ, you who lived in a human body, call us to community. Remind us that in you we are one. Awaken us a respect for one another and celebrate with us the diversity within that unity. May it be so now and forever. Amen. You are the divine creation, and it is not right for you to be alone. Know now that you are forgiven and called back into relationship with God and one another. I'll invite you now to start with our insert for communion as we celebrate World Communion Sunday. I'll remind us that at University Baptist Church, we practice an open table, meaning if you are here, you are welcome to partake in the meal. As you come forward, please use the center aisles and then return on the outer. That will help our flow this morning. May God be with you, and also with you. People of God, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. People of God, let us give thanks to the God who sets the table for us. We praise the Lord our God, who welcomes us with open arms. How lonely was chaos, gardener of the universe, until you spoke a word and your spirit created, leaves that burnish gold and red in autumn, you planted the seeds of joy in our ancestors, hoping they would pass them on to us. But they walked sin's lonely streets and drank the bitter tears death offered. Through the prophets came to remind us of your gratefulness, we continued to feast on wormwood and gall offered by the world, that you would not forget us, and so sent Jesus to bring us home to you. Therefore, we join our voices and we sing of your mercies made fresh in every moment. Holy, holy, holy God, of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Splashing in sin's puddles, Jesus washed our feet and dried them with his love, leading us into the kingdom. Daughters of despair, sons of sadness, orphans of woe, he gathers us all up in his arms of mercy, wiping out death, and sits us down at the family table. As we remember his grace and love, as we dare not forget his sacrifice for us, we can sing of that mystery we call faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. It is in the hope of the resurrection that we offer this blessing on World Communion Sunday. And the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. And the arms will be wide open to gather us in. And our hearts will be wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough and we will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame, and we will turn toward each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair, and we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world. We will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become the blessing, and everywhere will be the feast. The night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends in the upper room, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And pouring out the wine, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. Drink this in remembrance of me as often as you gather in remembrance of me. I'll invite our communion server forward.
I'll invite you now to join us in the Lord's <coughs> Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Join me in prayer. God of all creation, we give you thanks on this World Communion Sunday for the unity that we have in you. Bless the worldwide church, Lord, that we would see that we have more in common than different. We pray today, God, especially for our community and our church family. We continue to lift up Marcus and his recovery. We also ask that you would um, untie any bureaucratic red tape in those situations. We pray for Cecilia as she continues to um, work in our country, that you would put a path forward for her. We pray for our leaders, God, that you would continue to make them wise and that they would be open to hearing from you. And we pray that you would continue to bless our time together that we might quiet our worries and our fears long enough to hear from you again. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You can find it in your pew Bible on page 1,339. I am also reading from the NRSV. If, then... There is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let that same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave and being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to both will and work for his good pleasure. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God um, within us, thanks be to God. So when John Mark and I first started dating, we were going through all of those questions, those get to know you questions that couples ask. And so one of my questions was, what is your favorite holiday. 
Now, in my opinion, there's, there's basically two correct answers here, okay? And I know it's controversial, but obviously my favorite holiday is Christmas, right? You've got twinkly lights, you've got hot cocoa, you've got presents, you've got families, you've got all of the Hallmark movies ever with the same plot line, you know, that are still, you know, sometimes good. And so I love Christmas. And so I thought he was going to say Christmas. And then I thought, well, he could say Easter because theologically that would be correct. I mean, if you're going to celebrate a holiday, you pick the resurrection, the core of the Christian faith, okay? And so I'm like, Christmas or Easter. You're going to say one of these things. And he did not. John Mark's favorite holiday is Thanksgiving. And I was like, um, what? Because there's not even candy involved. There's just a a mess of cooking and and I guess football or Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. But, But to me, Thanksgiving did not rise to the occasion. I was like, I would have even taken a good solid debate for Halloween. I mean, I didn't grow up with that paganness, but I would have taken a good, solid debate around that, but no, Thanksgiving. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm going to keep dating this guy, but I'm really concerned about him. In 2019, he took me back to his home in East Tennessee. We flew from Colorado into Knoxville, and we went to his family's Thanksgiving. They nickname it the B&G Gathering, and it's been happening now for decades. And the interesting part about his family Thanksgiving is it's not his family. (laughs) I didn't meet any grandparents or cousins or aunts or uncles. Instead, I found a group of families that more than two decades ago decided that their family, their real family, their biological families, were too far or too scattered. And so they decided to make the commitment to gather every year for Thanksgiving. It was a chosen family situation. And I think what I love the most about it is it was simultaneously two things. It was special, and it was also very routine. (laughs) And so everyone knew at what point different families would arrive. Apparently, John Marks is always last, latest. (laughs) Sorry, babe. Um, (laughs) But, you know, there was something beautiful in that, in that we knew who was making what dish. We knew where it would get sat on the table. We knew where the kids' table would be. And also, at this point in our lives, it's something special, something that we don't get to do every day, a a new sort of feast. And I think communion is supposed to be both of those things. It is supposed to be ordinary, something we have a routine for, something we know the movements to, and it is something to be special, something to feel unique or, or different. Here at UBC, we take communion the first Sunday of the month. Other churches take it every Sunday. I grew up taking it four times a year. But however we take it, we are meant to be reminded of the unity we have around God's table. And that unity is appealed for in our text this morning in Philippians chapter 2. Now, if you were here in January, uh, you remember that this was our January Bible study was the book of Philippians. But just in case you weren't or you don't recall, I'll give us a crash course. Philippians is a letter written by Paul to the church at Philippi. The church has always been God's instrument in the world, and it always seems to have been a bit faulty of an instrument, right? And so Paul is writing to the church, and he's calling them out of some disagreement. Can you imagine disagreement in church? And apparently it's been so bad that two women in chapter 4 get named, okay? Like they were a big enough deal in church leadership that Paul literally has to call them out in this letter, but that's for later. So here we are dropping down into chapter 2, and it is all about unity. And so at the end of chapter 1, it says, Therefore, may you live a life worthy of the gospel. And then Paul is going to explain to us what a life worthy of the gospel actually is. He's going to lay it all out. And so he starts off asking us to have the same mind, to unite around this one shared value that is Christ. And I'm reminded that today is actually Jimmy Carter's 99th birthday. And I came across a quote from him, and he says, 
that we must resist the polarization that is reshaping our identities and politics. We must focus on a few core truths. We are all human, and we all have common hopes for our community and our country to thrive. And I think what Jimmy Carter knows is the same thing as what Paul knows. In order to have unity, we've got to be focused on the same goals, the same values. And so much of the American church has lost its way around that. We've sold out for lesser idols of wealth or prosperity or comfort or not rocking the boat, not offending people. But we're supposed to be keeping our eyes on Christ. And I always say that it's not what we focus on, it's who we're supposed to be focusing on. And this unity has diversity in it. You can't have a global church without diversity. The church is meant to reflect the globe, but there is a difference between uniformity and unity. And we often make that mistake. We often get those two confused. And so we have to remember that unity can look different but there can be diversity and grace in that difference rather than all sameness. And so Paul continues on, we're, we're called to unite around Christ, and then we get this hymn. This was probably one of the first hymns of the early church. It's one of the oldest pieces of scripture that we have. It's offset in your Bible, and that's the reason why. And he lays out what does it mean to follow Christ, to be Christ like. Verses 7 and 8 kind of lay out three things. Jesus emptied himself, and he, uh, being found in human likeness, he humbled himself, and then he became obedient. So he emptied, he humbled, he became obedient. And what does that look like for us? How can we do that? And so I think one of the things is we get confused around what is emptying. We think it's to become vacant, like, a, like an empty vessel or something that no longer has anything in it. But I think emptiness is actually being poured out, meaning that we are willing to give others grace and credit. It goes hand in hand with humility. And so the best example I could find of this, which is why I needed my paper, is that Adrian Rich in 1974 won the National Book Award in Poetry. She beat out Audre Lorde and Alice Walker. And when she got up to accept the award, she said this sentence. We, Audre Lorde, Adrienne Rich, and Alice Walker together accept this award in the name of all women whose voices have gone and still go unheard in the patriarchal world. The committee didn't know what to do with her statement. She alone got the award. They were honoring Adrian Rich. And what they did not know is all three women felt like their work was better because of the other. And they felt like all of their work was worthy of the award. And so they agreed in advance whoever won was going to read that statement because it was more important to honor the wider community than to get self-worth and praise for a sole individual. And so when we talk about self-emptying and humbling, it's not that we feel bad about ourselves or we're supposed to have low self-esteem. It's that we're supposed to be considering constantly our wider community and how can we uplift others with us on our way up in life. This whole chapter is about orthopraxis, it's a fancy word. And so a lot of our Christian life, we've gotten caught up in orthodoxy. What's the right thing to believe? What's the right thing to think? What's the actual answer about this? But Paul is saying, hang on, there is something that is equally important. And I say, if I'm going to veer one way, I would rather have right, right practice than right belief. I would rather say, have Jesus say to me, hey, your idea about baptism got a little off kilter there, then you missed the person in need in front of you, right? And so this chapter is calling us to right practice 
and that's how we are to operate in the world. We are to imitate Christ. And to imitate is different than to impersonate. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But to imitate means to to strive to be like Christ. That's why those WWJD bracelets took off, because they were hoping to imitate Jesus. But the problem was, folks turned into impersonators. They believed that they themselves were self-righteous, or that they themselves could save, that they themselves were above Christ. And so you and I are not called to be Jesus. Thank the Lord, okay? Because that would be too big of a job. But we are called to imitate his heart. And this is his heart, this humbling, emptying, and obeying God. And when we do that, we are able to create a world that looks like the kingdom of God here on earth. Last night, I had the opportunity to go to the Amy Grant concert. She was here in town playing the Sanger, and I saw some of y'all there, but I had a wonderful time. But there was this song that um, she sang that reminded me about World Communion Sunday and the work that you and I are called to. And it's called um, The Trees Will Never See. And I want to read a lyric from it. We're all sons and daughters, just ripples on the water, trying to make it matter until our time to leave. One day, they'll carve your name in stone and send your soul on home. Till then, it's praying for rain and pulling up weeds, planting trees we'll never see. Statues fall and glory fades, but a hundred-year oak still gives shade. And I thought that was a beautiful call for us to continue on being the church. Because a lot of what we do is planting seeds we'll never see. There there is fruit that we will not get to bear witness to. But World Communion Sunday reminds us that we are not alone in this work, that it is shared across the globe. And so my question for us today is what trees are you planting? What work are you doing? Not because you will get credit or you will see it, but because of the hope we have for the future. Let's plant trees we'll never see, church.
As we move into a time of response, I'll invite you to offer your prayers and praises up to God. This time is also open if you would like to officially become part of our church family or make a decision to follow Christ. Join and stand and sing hymn number 474, Softly and Tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See, on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Thank you. 